Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. What a mighty God we serve. Yes, he's mine. Yes, he's mine. I've got joy in my heart. I've got peace in my mind. Yes, he's mine. He is mine. I got joy in my heart. I got peace in my mind. He is mine. He is mine. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everyone. To the household of faith, we say praise the Lord. We apologize for the late start tonight. We had some uh, uh, technical difficulties. Um, I sincerely apologize and I anticipate even be able to make it on tonight, but somehow we got a breakthrough. And so we say praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, one and all. Amen. We'll do our best to try to uh, curtail some of the preliminaries and we will do our best to not keep you that long tonight. I know it's been a a late evening, so we'll condense our Bible study this evening. However, uh, I want to take a moment just to thank and praise God for everybody uh, being a part of our uh, midweek uh, Bible study last week, our um, one year later revival with Bishop Tyson. Amen. We thank and praise God for the mighty move of God that we uh, received, the impartation we received last week, and uh, hopefully, amen, you got something, amen, uh, from that dynamic service and perspective. We thank and praise God for him just being so good to us. Amen. The children of men, uh, we thank and praise God for him just loving on us. Aren't you glad that you serve a God that loves you? I know I am. I'm glad I serve a God who looks beyond uh, my faults and sees my needs. And so we certainly praise God for all of his goodness, for his bountiful blessings. Amen. If you've got a pen and a paper, amen, I want you just to take some of these quick notes down uh, just so that you have them for your own. Um, um, purposes. I uh, want to remind everyone um, that uh, we do have, amen, our in-person worship services that are coming up. Uh, join us in person at Bethesda Temple Church on uh, Sunday, May the 9th, which is Mother's Day. And so we look forward to everybody being with us in the sanctuary, 11 o'clock a.m. Um, and our Christian education amen, at the church. Amen. We hope that you'll join us for Mother's Day. Amen. As well as Pentecost Sunday, uh, which will be Sunday, uh, May the 23rd. So I'm hoping that everybody uh, will join us for uh, those two in-person worship services. Uh, we're getting information, gathering information uh, to review our options. And what we can do moving forward um, to make sure that we have a, a safe and conducive place of worship for everybody uh, to be with us. So stay tuned as we start um, unveiling our plans for re-entry. We certainly want to make sure that more people have access to the vaccine um, and that most importantly, we have all of our protocols and parameters in place um, for corporate worship. So again, May the 9th and May the 23rd, please do us a favor, RSVP, call the church, contact the church, every code 323-299-2591. We've missed you all. Amen. It has certainly been, amen, a challenge. Amen. We're approaching over a year that we've been having to do Bible study uh, from home and uh, our virtual services. Um, but thanks be to God that we see breakthrough on the way. Amen. I don't know about you, but just fill in the house. Breakthrough is on the way. So I hope that everybody will be patient with us for another season until we can sort out where we're headed. Um, but we thank God that there is a solution and we thank and praise God for his hand of healing. I wanted to give you all a chance for those that are, were interested uh, to check out um, the uh, uh, address from our president uh, to our Congress. Um, I think it's always important um, that we as uh, occupants, amen, um, of this great gospel also are aware and alert of the things going on in our country. And so I always thought it would be appropriate for us to take a few moments uh, to hear from our, our nation's leader um, about where things are headed in our country. And hopefully you got something from that and uh, certainly hope and pray um, that uh, you forgive us for uh, our tardiness tonight. And so, uh, again, want to just make you aware of those announcements concerning our in-person worship. Our seniors our seniors are getting together tomorrow at 4 o'clock p.m. on our prayer conference call line. Um, please don't hesitate uh, to contact us on that prayer line. Uh, that phone number is 425-436-320. Uh, know it by heart because we dial it almost every day. And our access code is 738-389. And so all the seniors uh, join Evangelist Green. Um, for that fellowship um, on tomorrow afternoon. 
Again, we say praise Lord to everybody. Come on in. Amen. We thank and praise God for his goodness. Let's go before our great God and a great word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your goodness, your mercy, your compassion, your loving kindness that fail not. We ask, oh God, that you be in our midst, oh God, to show up our understanding, oh God, even though we're together just for a brief period tonight, oh God, we pray, oh God, that you would bring meaning and purpose, oh God, uh, through your unadulterated word. I pray in the name of Jesus, oh God, that you would allow us to receive something uh, to increase our walk and confidence in you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. As you know by now, we start two Bible studies with our Bible study with two passages of scriptures. Uh, the first one can be found in the book of John, chapter number 8, verses 30 through 32. Uh, here we begin the reading of God's holy word. And as he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The other scripture that we always begin each Bible class with is 2 Timothy uh, chapter number 2 and verse number 15. Uh, which simply says, study the show thyself approved unto God, a work when you have not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And we thank and praise God that he's called us uh, into his own. Uh, he's called us into uh, the light of revelation, he called us to, amen, be disciples, to be uh, those who would uh, follow, amen, his footsteps, uh, footsteps and uh, his, amen, uh, uh, his word, uh, not just in word, but indeed uh, with our faith. And uh, we have a charge to continue uh, to studying God's word, amen, as it brings edification, it brings light, uh, it brings direction to our life. And uh, I hope and pray uh, that you will join us as we continue our series of teachings on how to please God. Uh, I know it's been a couple weeks, um, but we thank and praise God again for the burden we have to better understand God's expectations of him in an effort to please him in our day-to-day -day living. And so again, we're going to move very quickly tonight. Again, trust me, we're not going to be all night tonight. Uh, so we'll definitely catch up next week and get re-centered um, in our conversation, discourse, and study as it relates to how to please God. Uh, just by show of hands, how many of you just have a desire to please God, want to please God? Um, take a moment, uh, just show me your hands if that's one of your heart's desires, just to please God. Amen. I certainly hope it is. I uh, hope every day you get up, amen, it's with the burn and with the passion to get up uh, and want to serve God. And we get that exhortation from us um, um, you know, from the book of Second uh, Corinthians, chapter number five and verse number nine, um, it is a man, uh, the certainly uh, a whole lot here in this particular passage. But our marching orders, we start at verse number seven, tells us for we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. What is the reason why we have a desire to please God? It, our, that purpose is that, that the reason why our hands go up when we say we want to serve God, want to please God, is certainly because we understand, amen, that whether we are present or whether we're absent, we have an obligation to please him in all of our labor. And all we put our heart and mind to do, um, the responsibility of the believer uh, is to align themselves and to adhere themselves to live a life of faith, not by what they see, but, why, uh, um, but what they believe in faith. Amen. Knowing that, amen, whatever state we find ourselves in, amen, our obligation is to labor to serve God. My goal and ammunition, amen, admonition every day to get up is how do I please him? How do I serve him? Um, I'm telling you, there are certain individuals who um, are peak performers professionally because they have the assertiveness um, to grind even when nobody's watching. And those are the people who find themselves advancing and matriculating. You even see those people in ministry. Um, there are some people who, oh, I want to be used, I want to be used, I want to be used, but um, when you're not being used, um, you don't go hard, you don't pray, um, you don't do all the intangible things, um, but you can only do so when the spotlight is on. Um, and it speaks to where you are from a growth perspective. Some people are growing behind the scenes. Some people are growing in their maturation and in their service unto God, and God is seeing that, and he's pleased with it because he sees that our labors are not just on the stage. Our labors are not just when we come into the sanctuary. Come on, talk to me, somebody. It's not just when we're able to come back and we've got all these people in the sanctuary, then we can perform, and then we can show how faithful we are to the service or to the performance elements of it. No, the obligation we have as believers are to do the intangibles, uh, to labor Amen. And to amen to work, whether we're present or not, that we may be accepted of him. That happens. That level of acceptance happens um, because we're trying to please God. Amen. Not just with the surface he pleasing, because we know how to look, say, 
You can wear the right outfit and look saved. You can wear the right, amen, uh, ladies wear the right dress length and look saved. Brothers, you can wear the right suit and look saved. Um, you can have the appearance of uh, being saved and never live a life that's pleasing or acceptable to him. And so the intangibles happen when we really desire to please God, amen, in our secret prayer, our secret devotion. Look at all the things that the Lord tells us that happens. He talks about even those of us who pray, when we pray or consecrate, Amen. That's an effort to draw nearer to him, to cut aside the flesh and effort to live a life that's holy unto him. He says specific in his word uh, for those that want to pray and that want to perform and that want to platform for it. He shuns those individuals. Uh, but he says those who know how to pray in secret, you know, the ones that we were talking about. Amen. When he was teaching the disciples how to pray and fast, you had those who wanted to perform. They wanted to show people they were praying. They wanted to show people that they were living holy. And the Lord says they have their reward. But this reward that we're speaking of is a reward for those who choose to live a life that's acceptable up to him when nobody's watching, when nobody could care. Amen. That's how we tell the value of if we really live a life of holiness unto God. Let's go to first Colossians, or let's, I'm sorry, let's go to Colossians. Let's go to first Colossians. Colossians chapter number one, verses number nine through 10 also exhort us. They tell us this. Uh, for this cause, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and understanding, that you may walk, that you may walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. My God, that's a lot to process, but the embellishment here to those in the church of Colossae, amen, the Colossians, uh, were simply this. It was, it's our desire to imparting to you for us to feed you it's our desire uh to give you spiritual food that way amen and then we pray for you without ceasing that you might be filled with the knowledge of what god's will is for your life you can never live a life that's pleasing to god if you don't know what his will is and what his expectations are again i'm going back over how we got down this path right he says our desire our earnest prayer from the day that we first came in fellowship with you from the day i became your pastor here at bethesda church it's always been my desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of god God's will for your life, that you would understand him in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk a life that is worthy, amen, unto the pleasing of God in all areas of your life. And how do we know that that life is pleasing unto him? There's a fruit that's associated with it, that you would be fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God so that you move from being intrepid or insecure about God's will to having a knowledge of what God's will is, an expectation of what God's will is, and you purpose and endeavor forward. Amen? Again, that was the book of Colossians chapter number one, verses nine through 10 right? There are some byproducts associated with us living a life that's pleasing unto God. If there's one thing we should never forget in the book of Proverbs chapter number 16 and verse number seven, uh, it is a man Solomon in his wisdom who wrote many of the Proverbs, most of the Proverbs, but the Proverbs is he's known as the author of it. He says, when a, way, when a man's ways please God, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. I need you to understand something. The benefits of pleasing God, of coming into knowledge of who God's will is, amen, living a life that's purposed and endeavored to move forward in the pleasing of him will cause even those people who frustrate you in life to have to respect what you're doing for God. And only they can go so far. <laughs> when a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with them. You can't be serving God, living for God, having a, man, a righteous mind, having a renewed mind every day, getting up with the goal of pleasing God. You can't make this effort, make this goal, do all the cutting away of your flesh, do all the things necessary to live a life that's edifying unto God. And God not, amen, support your endeavor by causing even those people who are indifferent towards you to have peace with you. Nah, you understand that one of man's ways please the Lord. Could it be possible that the reason why you have so much turmoil, so much uh, uh, backbiting in your life, could it be possible, just possible, um, that some of the things that are going on in your life are because your ways, your ways, <laughs> please God. Notice, not aren't pleasing God. Notice what the scripture says here. It doesn't say that when your enemies please the Lord. It doesn't say when your enemies come into alignment with what God's hand on your life is. Your enemies would never come to the knowledge of what that assignment is, what that burden is, what that charge and responsibility you have is, but they must respect God at work. It's interesting here. Your enemy doesn't have to, amen, uh, uh, change his plan, change his strategy. He's going to always be your enemy. But when a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemy to be at peace with them. Better is a little with righteous with righteousness than great with the revenues without. 
right. I think you should put both those scriptures together. Again, that's book of Proverbs 16 and 7 and verse number 8 and get some meaning and get some understanding that if I live a life that's pleasing unto God, the scripture says it right here, a little bit of righteousness. <laughs> it is better <laughs> a little with righteousness than great revenue without right. Um, it's important to understand as believers, our purpose and goal should be every day to take that little bit step, that little bit, that little bit further that produces um, the character, that produces the mechanism, that produces, amen, the way of living, amen, that aligns us to God's word. And in doing so, it'll cause all the distractions to stop being distractions. Just serving God, living God, living. Don't tell me holiness doesn't work, y'all. The scripture says right here, man's ways please him. <laughs> it makes the enemy to be at peace with them. And the scripture says you're better, you're in better position with little, with a little bit of righteousness, uh, with uh, <laughs> better is your little, because in the eyes of people, righteousness doesn't stack up. It doesn't account for anything. Turning the other cheek, oh, that's that's your say, you know, uh, the, you know, nobody does it anymore. Taking the high road, who does it anymore? Who does that, right? Uh, it's better with a little. Better is a little with righteousness than the great revenues without it. It may feel as if you're being more, amen, rewarded for cutting corners. People may feel like they're being more, amen, uh, 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 placed up, you know, that they're benefiting because, amen, they're doing, they're not living a life that's pleasing unto God according to you. It's interesting how sometimes in life we do the eye test. And when we do the eye test, sometimes we'll look at somebody else's situation, we'll look at somebody else's uh, 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 life, and we'll start examining why well, should be here because of this? Why well, should be because of that? And we sometimes scratch our head and says, "How is it?" And 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 I know it's true because even the psalmist said, "How is it that my enemies are prospering and I'm serving God?" It doesn't feel like it's 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 paying off. Look at what Solomon and all of his wisdom drew the conclusion of in his writings. He just said, "Hey, better is a little with righteousness <laughs> than great revenues without right," which means it makes no sense. You could have it all. But without righteousness and without a clear conscience and without the peace of God and without understanding God's will to stir you to good works, amen, all of that is in vain. All that is for nothing. So I'd rather have the righteousness of God. I'd rather have uh, the, uh, I'd rather have holiness unto God. I'd rather have a burden of conviction to live and serve him um, than have the abundance of not living for him or not serving him. Praise God. All right. So once again. How do we see those fruits? We see those fruits of, of serving God, living God, because we begin to notice that, amen, even in the midst of chaos and the enemies will keep, it'll, it'll, it'll keep, you know, trying to badger you, trying to take you off course. But there'll come a point when your ways will please God to the point that your enemies, even enemies have to be at peace with you. Let's go to the word of the Lord in the book of Hebrews, chapter number, amen, 12. And again, I'm going to dive into this. I know I won't be able to exhaust it all tonight. Again, my apologies for the delay. Come on in. Hit the share button. Hit the like button. Hit the heart button. Amen. Say praise the Lord to us so we know that at least, amen, you are, amen, viewing uh, the broadcast without much interruption tonight. Amen. The book of Hebrews tonight, I want to start at around verse number 25 through 29. All right. Ah, oh. <laughs> Hmm. Okay, let me back up. Hmm. Okay, let me back up. Uh, verse number 24. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of the sprinkling, that speaketh better things than that of Abel. We're ultimately getting there because if there's one thing that I want you to write down, uh, it's going to be the course of, I think, the next couple of weeks since we're cutting tonight off is that, amen. We please God in our worship. We please God in our worship. We please God in our worship. We talked about our, our first principle of, 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 uh, how we please God is through our faith. Um, we learn, amen, even through the chastisement of Jesus, amen, even through all that he went through, his obedience to the cross, amen, brought glory to God because of his faith to believe that God would help him to endure even those most difficult times on Calvary's cross. We're shifting now into a life that's pleasing unto God, which is a life of worship. And our first thought that we get is from the book of Hebrews chapter 24, I'm sorry, verse number 12, uh, uh, Hebrews 12. Verse number 24, again, Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkling of blood that speaketh better than the things that of Abel. Ah, there, there's a, there is a correlation that is being drawn here by the writer of Hebrews um, that speaks to the bold sacrifice of Abel, his blood speaking, his blood being perfect. Abel had a perfect sacrifice unto God. He is saying that Jesus, through his work on Calvary, through his obedience and through his faith to the Calvary's cross, he becomes the new mediator of the new covenant. 
Mm. He becomes our propitiation of sin. He becomes the new access that we have now to restore relationship with God. Amen. Through the sprinkling of blood. And he says that that ultimate sacrifice is far better than that we ever appreciated the sacrifice of Abel. How do we know that? Because we know that Abel's blood would continue to speak. Amen. His sacrifice would speak forever and ever. And I'm going to deal with that concept of, of getting to a place of worship that speaks for you. Uh, we learned that in the book of Hebrews 11. When you go through the, the through the hall of faith in the book of Hebrews 11, you get to Abel and it speaks about Abel's blood speaking, amen, uh, even uh, in his death. You know, that ultimate sacrifice was something that the Hebrews, something that those Israelites held in great esteem. As the story was told from generation to generation, amen, they marveled at the ultimate sacrifice of Abel. Every sacrifice was to be presented unto God in a fashion that was pleasing. And so this was the prototype of that sacrifice. When Jesus goes to Calvary's cross and he stretches himself on Calvary's cross and the blood comes from him, you have the writer of Hebrews saying, we're in a new covenant. And in this new covenant, anything that you thought that might have been your perfect example of worship on, 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 uh, under uh, the watch of the old regime, under the law, amen, under the things that we saw, amen, that were exemplified in the works of Abel, have now been replaced by a mediator, amen, who is Jesus. And his blood speaks even more louder, is more potent, is more powerful than that demonstration, amen, that we've seen, amen, through the life of Abel. That's hard for people who have been scattered to imagine, because again, the, cru the, the crux of, amen, the book of Hebrews is understanding that you're arriving at a place called better. It's introducing people who have had a model of living, a model of understanding of is Israeli, Israelite teaching, culture, amen, have been impressed upon, amen, above all the things that were associated with Moses and all of the old temple and tabernacle ways. The whole purpose of Hebrews is to tell you that now that Jesus has come, everything is better. Better. We have a better example. We have a better advocate. We have better. Better is a life with amen Jesus. And so again, in the world of the Israelites, there is no greater example. Everybody's trying to live up to that manner. Amen. That my sacrifice is so acceptable unto God. Amen. That amen. It is told of even from generation to generation. The writer of Hebrews is specific in saying when Jesus comes, his power is sacrifice. Amen. Is amen. It's so potent that it exceeds what Abel did. And you have to understand that literally is a culture shock for people. Amen. Because again, they're having a hard time grappling Jesus, they're having a hard time processing Jesus, they're having a hard time understanding, amen, who was stronger and mightier than that of Moses and who was that uh, of greater reputation than David. Amen. These are all the things that we hear of even women of the well. Our fathers worship, amen, those of, amen, of old. You, you know, again, there's a culture that had been riveted by the working and the works, amen, of old teaching, amen. So again, Jesus comes, he is, amen, a better sacrifice, amen. He is the new covenant, amen. His, his blood speaketh better than that of Abel. All right, see verse number 25. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. Ah, see that you don't refuse this blood. See that you don't refuse this ultimate sacrifice. We're talking about worship, all right? For if they escape not who refused him that spake on the earth, much more shall we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. Again, this is a, amen, a, 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 uh, uh, this is a alliteration or this is an attempt to speak to the Hebrew, uh, to the uh, Israelites and the Hebrews of those who, amen, appreciated the sacrifice of Moses. The context of this particular text, amen, deals specifically with Moses coming from the mountains and God speaking, amen, and as Moses spoke, amen, the earth began to shake, amen, and we could not escape, amen. Uh, he says, this voice that is coming is such a more powerful voice that we would behoove us, amen, as believers under this new covenant, not to ignore this voice. Do not ignore the voice of Jesus. Do not ignore the voice of him who made sacrifice. He says, if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, amen, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, yet more, uh, yet once more, I shake not uh, the earth only, but also heaven. Again, he's saying there's a more powerful voice that is coming. When Moses came and gave the law, when Moses spoke, amen, when, when amen, the voice of the Lord came, amen, it shook, and there was a fear associated with those words. He's saying under this new covenant, Jesus now when he speaks, he's speaking with the promise saying that yet once not only am I going to shake the earth, but also the heavens. And this word, yet once more, signified the removal of those things that are shaking as of the things uh, that are made. 
that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Again, again, this is a, amen, alliteration. Amen. This is a, this is paying segue. This is paying appreciation. Amen to, amen, the old mantles, the old way of doing things, the Old Testament understanding of covenant. However, under the new, he's saying this word that comes forth. He is the word because he is the word made flesh. <laughs> this word, yet once more, it signifies removal of all the things that were shaken. This is a voice, amen, that comes, amen, that will shake us to a place, amen, but will allow us to remain even in the time of calamity, even in the time of turmoil. Let me go and just give you um, an example, amen, of how this, amen, would read, amen, in the Message Bible. Let me just pull the Message Bible just so you can understand it. He said this. He says, uh, backing up to verse number 22 through 24. No, this is not your experience at all, that uh, you've come to Mount Zion. The city where the Lord, uh, or the city where the living God resides, the invisible Jerusalem, is populated by throngs of festive angels and Christian citizens. It is the city where God is judge, with judgments that make us just. We, uh, you've come to Jesus, who presents us with the new covenant, a fresh charter from God. He is the mediator of this covenant. Uh, the murder of Jesus, unlike Abel's homicide that cried out for vengeance, became a proclamation of grace. I love what the, what, uh, what the Message Bible says. He says in a Message Bible in verse number 25 to 27 says this. So do not turn deaf ear uh, to these gracious words, the words of Jesus that says, hearken, come after me, yield with me, sup with me, right? Worship me. Uh, if those who ignored earthly warnings did not get away with it, what will happen to us if we were to turn our backs on heavenly warnings? His voice uh, that time shook the earth to its foundation. This time, he's told us uh, quite plainly, he will also rock the heavens. Um, one last shaking from the top and the bottom, stem to stem, the phrase one last shaking means a thorough, uh, a thorough house cleaning, getting rid of all the historical and religious junk so that the unshakable essentials stand clear and uncluttered. His voice is coming, amen. His presence comes, amen, to shake us, to shake us from all the things, amen, that were symbols of worship, amen, that brought no edification, amen, historical things, uh, ideologies, religiosity, amen. His voice has come, amen, to bring a cleaning, to come bring, amen, a potence to our life, to allow us to get rid of all the things, amen, uh, that do not build our faith so that the unshakable essentials stand clear and uncluttered. To be a worshiper that pleases God, you must, amen, have a clear conscience and a mind that is not cluttered, amen, uh, uh, that does not equate religiosity with worship unto God. If there's one thing that plagues us, even from generation to generation, it's this thought that ritual uh, societies worship, um, that our, amen, our, our coming to church, amen, means we have fellowship. Our coming to church means we have relationship with God. No, he says you are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. You are receiving an impartation that cannot be shaken. Once you, amen, allow God to come in, when he speaks, he's going to speak from top to bottom. He's going to bring about a cleansing, amen, and our worship will become, amen, not only essential but clear, amen, but will also be uncluttered, and the things that are to remain shall remain. He says, all right, let me go back now over to the King James Version, all right? Let's go to verse number 27. He says, and this word yet once more signifying, okay, we got that part. Let's go down to verse number 28 because that's what we wanted to get. Verse number 28 and verse number 29. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, right? Cannot be moved. We getting this impartation of God through his shaking that cannot be ruined. He says, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Amen. Once God comes in and does the shaking and the rearranging, he says, now that we have received the kingdom, now that we have received the blood, now that we have received this impartation through the work of Jesus Christ, he says, let us have grace. In order for us to please God, we must be, amen, not only the recipients of grace, but the granters of grace as well. Let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably, amen, with reverence and with godly fear. I love, amen, how, amen, uh, the uh, uh, the English version, uh, um, English Standard Version of the Bible uh, kind of gives us um, our uh, uh, reimagination of that. So the English Standard Version of the Bible tells us, therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. 
Amen. I just love how different interpretations get, amen, uh, an opportunity for us to see the world with a bit more clarity. Amen. Um, again, if we look at it in another fashion, if we look at it from the Amplified, the Amplified says, therefore, we have received a kingdom which cannot be shaken. Okay. Let us show gratitude and offer God pleasing service and acceptable worship with reverence and awe for God is indeed a consuming fire. In order for us, amen, to understand the elements of pleasing God, it starts with our understanding that he's a jealous God. We go to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 23 and 24, amen, he's one that does not like his worship to be shared, amen, he's not insecure, he's absolute. There's a difference. <laughs> Um, there's some people who are jealous because they're insecure. They're jealous because they don't have an esteem about themselves. No, he's a jealous God because he's absolute. There is nobody like me. I sit in the council of no one. I need y'all to catch this word tonight. It's brief and I'm getting ready to wrap up. I got a few minutes, right? So he's absolute because he's absolute. There again, there's some people who are very jealous because they're insecure. They're insecure of their, amen, uh, uh, physique. They're insecure. You're talking about in a relationship. Some people can just be insecure, um, whether you give them a reason or not to be. There are some things that cloud their mind that assume that your eyes are wandering or, or that I don't have your full divided attention. And because of that insecurity, I'm jealous every time you engage with someone else. There is none of that in God. He is jealous because he's absolute. He's saying to himself, if I have the entire package, all grace, all favor, all healing, all deliverance, everything is made up of my deity. I'm all powerful. I'm omniscient. I'm omnis omniscient. Uh, uh, um, I have all power. Um, I have all dominion. Amen. I said in the council of myself, why would you want somebody else? And so he's jealous. Amen. Because of our decision making. He's not insecure. He doesn't feel any less about himself. He's saying to himself, well, how am I not adequate? Why are you choosing to give worship to something else? So in order for you to understand that concept, amen, of him being a jealous God, then you better understand the last verse, which is verse number 29, which says that we serve a God which is a consuming fire, which means that we serve a God who is holy. We serve a God who requires, amen, amen, his people to render unto him something holy and acceptable unto God. I hope you can marry those two concepts and understand how we can please God. We can please God by giving him our undivided attention, Right. By not allowing the distractions of the world and of time and this stuff to hinder our amen focus in our worship and relationship with God. And secondly, we also can do so by knowing that God desires to be uh, uh, worshiped in the beauty of holiness. That's who he is. Amen. That's exactly amen. His mantra. OK, so once you have that understanding uh, of his uh, of his amen, uh, uh, his jealousy, amen but also, amen, walk in the fear of him and know he, that he certainly is holy, then it gives us an opportunity for us to walk in the grace, the grace that allows us to realize I'm not just serving anybody. I'm serving with someone who looks past, who cleans me, who uh, washes me, who atones me, amen, who gives me, amen, a, a new lease on life, amen, as well as someone, amen, who, amen, is uh, the center of my attention, someone who, again, requires, has an expectation of me for me to bring something onto him that is acceptable, only onto him. All right, as I close, let's go over to the book of Hebrews, chapter 13 and verses 13, 16. Hey, Christopher, amen. Hey, man. Hi. Hey, praise the Lord. <laughs> amen. All right. So let's go to the book of Hebrews, chapter number, amen, 13, amen, verses uh, 13 through 16. Amen. Here we get the reading of God's holy word. Let us go therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. Uh, for we have, uh, for here, have no, uh, can, I'm sorry, let me slow down, back up for a second. All right. <laughs> let, us, uh, let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp bearing his reproach. For here have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to him. Um, but to do good and to communicate, forget not. Uh, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Uh, I could go into verse number 17 on Beatles that rule over thee, but I will stop right there. Amen. And try to, amen, uh, shed some light or try to, amen, uh, 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 bring uh, uh, some clarity concerning this thought right here. 
all right? Um, the thought of worship being sacrificed, I mean, the, the thought that God desires the fruit of our lips, he desires our best, and most importantly, he desires our love and affection and our service unto others through our giving, all right? The Message Bible says this in Hebrews 13, amen, verse 13. Uh, so let's go outside where Jesus is, where the action is, amen? That's how we, amen, can even worship God. He says, do this, not trying to be privileged insiders, amen, but taking our share in the abuse of Jesus, being crucified with Christ. This entire world is not our home. He says, uh, we have our eyes peeled for the city about to come. Let us take our place outside with Jesus, no longer pouring out sacrificial blood of lambs, but pouring out sacrificial praises with our lips unto God in Jesus' name. Make sure that you don't take things for granted and go slack in working for the common good. Share what you have with others. God takes particular pleasure in acts of worship, a different kind of sacrifice that could take place in kitchen and workplace and on the streets. Again, the Message Bible sometimes gives you a different alliteration, amen, a different uh, perspective uh, to kind of take a look at, amen, the text. Uh, however, I mean, if, if we back up for just a quick second, amen, we have a burden and responsibility in our worship, amen, not just to be, amen, the type that worship in, a sanctuary. It's a different kind of worship. And then again, I'm going to get to the sacrifice of worship and the tangible associated with worship. Uh, if there's one thing that was pressed by my heart, amen, it was the desire for us to take a look at worship through our giving and our service unto others and the ways we can please God. We have a responsibility, amen, to go from the camp, to leave, amen. This is not really what I believe our charge has been in this pandemic, to leave the camp, right, and to bear the reproach of, of he that endured. That's what the scripture says. It's our job to take this gospel out, amen, and to be a blessing to those, right? So in many cases, we've been having in the midst of this entire pandemic to reshift our focus, right? Taking the gospel from the camp, amen, and bearing the reproach of him that endured. He says, for we have no lasting city here, <laughs> right? Right. So we're stuck in the camp paying attention to all of the wonders of the sanctuary and all the wonders of the things down here, uh, failing to realize that we're not seeking something here on earth. I mean, uh, for as much as we enjoy Los Angeles, we're not looking for, to see, amen, how God blows up Los Angeles. We're waiting for a city. We're seeking a city that is yet to come. He says, uh, so through him, let us continue to offer up the sacrifice of praise to God. Our worship has to be sacrificial, amen. The sacrifice of worship means I have to be willing to give up something. I've never seen people who say I'm worshipers, um, but don't want to give up anything, um, whether it be our time, whether it be our energy, whether it be our resources. No, we're not even going to get on tithes, you know, because uh, there's this new this new thought that, you know, tithes ain't relevant no more in a new covenant, right? <laughs> no, it says the sacrifice has always been an order. Uh, 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 tithes, amen, um, uh, uh, tithing, amen, is not specific to Old Testament or New Testament. It's a principle of faith um, that's not held to any particular uh, uh, dispensation. Uh, it's a principle of sacrifice. It's temp uh, uh, um, uh, it is a, a, a typology, amen, of our fruits unto God. And so he says, let us continue uh, continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. Let it be something that wires us. Let it be something that uh, 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 becomes our ingenuity, okay? He says, that is the fruit, amen, of our lips that acknowledges his name. Uh, I'm reading that from the ESV. When we think of fruit, we think of something that grows. We think of something. So something for something to be fruit, it must be something that's on the inside of us that regiments, that gets amen, germinated, that sprouts, that what comes forth, amen, would be pleasing unto God. I could tell you that worship becomes a lifestyle because worship has more to do what's on the inside of you uh, than it has anything to do with what really comes out of you. It's where worship starts. Worship starts on the inside of us, right? In order for something to become fruit, it has to germinate, it has to take seed, it has to take root, right? And so for something to be, amen, if the fruit of our lips, right, for something means it has to literally be something that's birthed out of experience, has to be birthed out of something, amen, that's not seen. And so literally the life of worship that's pleasing, acceptable unto God really starts with an examination of the heart. It starts literally, amen, with pleasing God in the ways that aren't honorable. That's where worship starts, right? The fruit of our lips, right? Acknowledging his name. 
we don't even get a chance to acknowledge the sovereignty and holiness of his name until we get to an awareness and a conscious of our mind that allows, amen, the things that are germinating in our mind and our heart and our soul, like Evangelist Brown was talking about, to manifest and come forth from our lips. So what's, what's, what's on the inside of us is what comes out, the fruit of our lips. And so we can't have stuff that comes out to bring glory unto God that's not rooted in the understanding of who God is, the awareness of his holiness, the understanding of his jealousy, and the understanding of his consuming fire nature, all right? So again, that's what we get here, all right? He says, and then when worship is, is something that becomes for the lip or something that moves from being generally on the inside to coming out of the lip, he says, then after we do this in acknowledgement or praise and worship unto God, we have an obligation to go further. Once we leave the camp, right? Once we, amen, continually offer up sacrifice of praise unto God, once we give him the first fruits of our lips, acknowledging his name, he says, do not neglect to do good and to share what you have with others. For such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Worship is giving. Worship is giving. Somebody put that in the comment section as I get ready to close this out. Worship is giving, right? This is another element of worship. How do we please God? We please God in worship, but the worship that comes from us starts with what's in our heart. Right. Everything that we're talking about here starts in our heart. It moves from the experience or the encounter um, that we get on the day of Pentecost. It moves from amen, being inside the camp to going outside the camp to taking on the burden for us having a desire to seek something beyond ourselves. Amen. And then it comes, amen, through the form of us continuing sacrificing unto God. That's worship. Give him the first fruits of our of our lips, acknowledging his name. But then most importantly, we please God when we do not neglect to do good. There's a whole lot we can do that. We, we can dissect good in a lot of different ways, right? Do good, right? <laughs> That's what the new mantra of the day is. Do good, seek justice, seek peace, right? With all the uh, protests stuff going on. The admonishment we have here, uh, again, from the writer of Hebrews is that let's not neglect the responsibility and the charter we have to do good. That means righteousness, right? We talked about, remember, the little righteousness we talked about in the book of Proverbs 16, right? Let's not neglect the burden, the charge we have to do good and to share what we have with others for such sacrifices. Doing good is a sacrifice, y'all. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Doing good sometimes don't feel good. Doing good sometimes means you have to give something up. That's all a part of worship. Worship is giving. To do good means I have to give up myself, my energy and my time, concentrating myself to attempt and to share my focus to do something that's pleasing unto God, right? He says, do good, right? Share with others for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. God is pleased, amen, when, amen, the things that come from our lips are things that are germane in our spirit, that come from our heart, that are things that are implanted in us and our understanding and awareness of who he is. But God is pleased uh, when we move, amen, from self-centered, self-centeredness and our own personal needs to, amen, making it a prerogative of ours to go out and to do good and to share what we have with others. It's these sacrifices, these things are part of the worship experience that bring pleasure and are pleasing unto God. He loves when we give to others. He loves when we pour into others. He loves when we give up ourselves. He loves when, amen, we have a measure of faith because again, it all ties together. We have faith that pleases God. We're not moving into worship that pleases God. Uh, of worship that means giving that means sharing that means getting out of our comfort zone that means getting out of our box that means stop being so rigid stop being so uptight stop being so one-sided stop being so nobody stop being a closet christian right get out of that get out of literally the camp and go out and bear amen the reproach that he endured right by doing good do not neglect to do good share what you have with others for these sacrifices that we give the giving of ourselves please god we're going further, y'all. And this is all part of worship. This is all part of, this is even before we lift our hands and we get into the nuances of what it is to have a relationship with them. Now, mind you, many of this, this leaving the camp starts with you leaving with an understanding of what worship is. Mm. Like I said, I don't have time to get it all tonight because I promised to bring me the Bible class. This assumes that you're leaving the camp to go out and to bear the reproach of he that endured. That means you know everything about Jesus, what his expectations are. So sometimes you have to reverse engineer, start on the back end and move forward. 
but just know that God is pleased in our personal sacrifices. He's pleased when we give up our energy and our time and our efforts to other people. I pray that this short word tonight, this Bible class blessed you. I pray the grace of God was with you. There is more to dissect in pleasing God. Change your expectations, saints. I mean, come, come from this expectation that I can only be served. Uh, come to the expectation that you stop being a performer. Can we, can we stop being actors? Amen. Amongst ourselves and be vulnerable enough. Amen. To give up ourselves and do good and to share what we have with others, that God would be pleased with our sacrifice. Uh, and the most important, the body of Christ would benefit from our transparency and our growth. Know that God is seeing our personal sacrifices and it brings pleasure to him. How can you please God? By, by stop being so self-absorbed and being so selfish and so uptight and so, amen, calculated with what you have. Amen. Ask God, hey, I want to give you what you've invested in me. The fruit comes out of that. The fruit is what comes out of the ground. It comes out of the heart. It comes out of the mind. It comes out of the spirit. It comes, it comes out of the soul. So the fruit that comes forth is a reflection of what's in you. We're leaving the camp with the understanding to go out to impact the world. May the grace of God go with you. May the favor of God go with you. This is Pastor Kyron Short on behalf of myself and Lady Short and the entire Blessed Simple Church family. We thank you for joining us for this brief Bible class tonight. Amen. As we go a little bit further in our study of pleasing God. Again, we apologize for technical difficulties and thank you for rocking with us. Everybody grab a seat. I want you to go over to Amen. Cash app to PayPal. Amen. Go out to Zale. Let's be a blessing to the household of faith. Amen. It's been a few weeks since we've had a chance to give it a midweek platform. Join me. Let's see if we're really about worship. Let's, let's see if we just all talk or if we really have a mindset to give. God is pleased when we give. God is pleased when we do good. Amen. God is pleased. Amen. Even when we give him the first fruits of our increase. Right. We'll get into that worship. Amen. That deals with the fruit. Amen. Because in order for you to give, it means there's got to be something in you. And get on, amen, I have no expectation of people that have nothing to give tithes, but if God has placed something in you and you want to keep that thing, amen, growing in your life, it behooves you to tithe, amen, uh, I'll let it go, but uh, and I'm, I'm not even going to touch, amen, Hebrews 13 and 17, but amen, Hebrews 13 and 17 is something every, every believer should take a chance to look at um, and read and digest, um, because we have a tendency sometimes, amen, to forget what it's all about, what our responsibility is, and how even our worship is tied to our obedience and submission to God's leadership. Amen. That's why I thought it was so important for us um, that we even be partners in this season with what's going on uh, with our president, um, because we do live in this world, all right? Even though we don't agree with some of the policies, we have to humble ourselves and submit ourselves even to leadership, uh, because again, I love that verse. I love that verse, that verse number 14. I'm telling you that we could shout out all night uh, for here. We have no continuing city. We have no city. Uh, the, the, it's over. You know, you can get on. Sometimes you can go on the five. It's like the five runs forever. Or you get on, you know, Crenshaw Boulevard and Crenshaw Boulevard just goes forever. No, the, we have no continuing city. And this thing is coming to an end, y'all. <laughs> we seek one that is to come. And we'll get there by living a life that's acceptable unto God, raising our expectation, even in our worship unto God, giving him the fruits of our lips, the fruits of our prosperity, of what he's placed on the inside of us, giving God our best. Tonight, even in your worship and giving, give God your best. If you don't know Jesus is a part of your sin, you can know him right now. You can be water baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost. God has been moving in a mighty way. God bless you, Brother Christopher. Amen. We have been. Amen. I think he wants it tonight. All right. Uh, God's moving a mighty way. He's been saving. We're believing that God is completing salvation. Amen. Uh, for those who seek the Holy Ghost uh, before it's everlasting too late, y'all. We have a city. Amen. In the distance. Amen. We have no continuing city down here. We seek the one that is to come. And so I hope that you will uh, ride with me on this ride, y'all, as we understand God's expectation for us. Amen. Even in worship. Amen. And then ultimately, if you want to know where we're going, we're going to, amen, how we please God through our obedience. So see faith that leads to worship and worship that leads to an obedience. So I hope that you'll bear with us. Amen. I'm praying even now, Father, in the name of Jesus, touch families, their prayer requests, petitions, those who are in need. Father, you know what they stand in here tonight, oh God, wherever they may be, oh God, I pray, oh God, that you would allow them, oh God, to tap into the worshiper that they are, oh God, to allow the things that you've placed in them, oh God, to be the very essence of what comes out of them, the first fruits of their worship and increase tonight, oh God. I pray, oh God, that this Bible class be meaningful and impactful to someone, and that someone make a decision even now uh, to either change course and come back to you 
for that someone be restored, that someone will be forgiven, oh God, that families are reunited, oh God, somebody's healing, deliverance will come. Most importantly, oh God, that somebody would hear this message out there and say, I gotta be saved. I gotta know you in the part of my sin. We love you, God. We praise you. We adore you. Give us clean hands and a pure heart, oh God, even as we worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. This is your boy, Pastor Kyron Shorter. We love you. May the grace of God go with you. Have a great rest of the night, y'all. Take care. Peace.